what you're gonna do. You can't fight the future. Wrestling God. ProWrestlingRadio.com presents. Are you talking to me? Pro Wrestling Radio. Live. Online. You think The Rock actually cares? What is he doing here? Oh, it's true. I'm bringing everybody with me. Be awesome. That's hard time. But be the man. Six. One. Can you feel it? I hate your ever. Hold oh, the damn fool. That's how I roll. You're six. Come get some because I've done all of that. The king is back on his throne. And that's the bottom line because Stone Cold said so. And we are live on Pro Wrestling Radio. My name is Eric Arjulo, and I am here with my co host, as always, Luke Hawks. And we have a lot to get to. We are back after. Uh, after a week off, and um, I believe, Luke, are we going to be here for the hour, or are we going to be here for 45 minutes tonight? We'll be here as long as it takes. I said we do this, we knock it out, and, you know, we roll with the punches. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Uh, and, you know, if you're listening to the show, um, I, I have this show all over the place. I have this show on YouTube. I have this show on iTunes, on Stitcher. I have it. Um, I, I, put, I put it up on a couple of other different places, too. So if you're listening to this uh, recorded, uh, you can always join the show live over at ProWrestlingRadio.com backslash listen. And uh, you don't have to download anything. You could just um, listen to it right there. We broadcast on Mixler. And there's also a chat room that you could jump, jump into as well. All you have to do is log in with your social media credentials. So, yeah, you can do that um, when we broadcast the show live. But with that said, Luke, there is a lot to get to, I think, the um, the first topic on the board today would be Extreme Rules. Um, you know, the pay-per-view was this past Sunday night. I got a chance to see it. Did you get a chance to see the show? No, I, miss, I missed out. Perry got to see it, though. Oh, Perry got to see it. Did Perry like the show? Perry, Perry's Luke's son, by the way. Yeah, I don't know. Did you like the show? Uh, it was a pretty good pay-per-view, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I was uh, I had I had a show myself, so I was on the road all Sunday, so I didn't I didn't get back until about one in the morning. Well, one Monday morning. Oh, okay. What, what did you What did you hear about it? Like from from your friends or your colleagues? Well, the biggest thing I seen mostly was on Twitter was the finish between Cena and Ryback. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, I should have got should have Googled it and, and you know tried to pull up a little link to see uh to see what they did. But uh, and what, what ended up happening? What, what was the big commotion about? Yeah. Okay. So here's the deal. Um, you know, for those of you that don't know, uh, they were, uh, they had a, um, a last man standing match. And for those of you that don't know, uh, last man standing match is basically like the old school Texas death matches that I used to watch as a kid, um, here in, uh, Philly when, when WWF and WWF would come to town, they'd have these Texas death matches where, you know, the guys would have a 10 count to get up and whoever couldn't get up past the count of 10, the other guy was the winner. So, you know, they had their match, which actually really wasn't that bad. It was a lot better than, than I thought it was going to be, at least the first half. Um, the second half got a little ridiculous, and we can get into that. But the story here is really the finish. Uh, the finish of the match was Ryback picking up Cena and giving him a spear through the wall, like through that, that like stage wall where they all come out. Uh, you've come out of that wall uh, several times in your career, so, so you know, right. you're familiar with that wall. Um, so Ryback speared him through the wall, and they, they played it off like they were, they, there was electrocution, there were shocks, they had like some, some minor pyro go off. And, <laughs> yeah, and then they show, show them um, backstage, and they're both down. They're both down, they're both out, Cena's not moving, Ryback's moving a little bit, and they're playing it off like it's a real deal, like these guys are really hurt, and you know, there's a serious injury here, but what winds up <laughs> happening is, uh, God bless you. Uh, well, thank, thank you. Yeah, what winds up happening is the medics put um, a neck brace on Cena and wind up taking him out on a stretcher where they help Ryback and and he leaves and he walks back and what was weird about it Luke was they didn't announce the the winner at that point they just kind of cut away and I'm looking at this thing and I'm saying okay you have Cena being stretchered out in a neck brace you have Ryback who's up with help of course but he's up and walking to the back by the rules of a last man standing match, Ryback should be the winner. You know, he, he's up, he's walking, whether it's with assistance or not. Cena's not, he's on the stretcher, and they never announced the finish. They, their, their excuse was that neither guy got up at the count of 10. 
Um, so it was a draw, but they never announced it. It was it was a bullshit finish, and it was, it was bull because they didn't even announce it. So they knew that it was a bad finish. Well, and, didn't they didn't they do the same thing Monday night with with Kurt Axel? I know we'll get into this later, but with Kurt Axel and uh, and Triple H, they they didn't announce a finish where Triple H should have been counted out. Yeah, it was so it's so bizarre, Luke, that they would do this stuff two nights in a row. They do these like major injury angles two nights in a row. So yeah, so basically the controversy around this finish is that it's a last man standing match and you had Ryback walking away essentially seen as stretchered and yet he didn't get the title and you know for me Luke I don't really have a problem with that finish in any other match I mean you know I think it's actually a pretty creative finish because neither guy has to, has to do a job and they're both they're both put over strong so you can come back with the rematch but why in the world would you do a la- why would you book a last man standing match if that's your finish so I don't know about you you know you're kind of hearing hearing the finish from me um right. What are your thoughts on it? I mean, I, I didn't see it, but the way you described it, I, I like I, like you said, I would think it's a BS finish. Yeah. Uh, you know, if Ryback would – and I, I say that because the way you explain it, it sounds like the belt should have been the Ryback if, if, if both men weren't, you know, completely down and out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's the controversy. And, you know, the fans in St. Louis were, were chanting bull. And, you know, Twitter was going nuts uh, with people chanting. And, you know, it's like, I don't really care. I'm not invested one way or the other. I could really care less if Ryback goes over or Cena goes over. But, you know, you're charging people 50, 60 bucks to watch this last man standing match. You have a guy get up and walk away. Yeah. And, 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 and you're not giving him a finish. It just seemed kind of, kind of cheap to me. Yeah. 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 I would imagine. I'd, it sounds like I'd be pissed if I would have paid for the pay per view. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and on top of that, and, and it turned into a little bit more controversial because, you know, they were they were promoting this um, post-game show throughout the pay-per-view. They were doing this post-game show, and I didn't see it. Once the pay-per-view was over, I was done. I, 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 went, I went, went up to bed. But from, from what I, I, I saw the next morning, that Cena took his neck brace off and really didn't even sell the injury on the post-game show. So it's like, okay, you have this finish where this guy stretched out with a neck brace, and then, you know, 20 minutes later, he's on the post-game show just hanging out. And cool. it's funny because I was talking to one of the writers on Camel Clutch blog about it, and I said that it's a perfect finish for a heel champion. You know, you have a heel champion in one of these kind of matches, and you have that champion kind of fake it, so to speak, that he gets taken out in the stretcher, and he gets taken out with the neck brace, and then once, you know, everything kind of settles down, you see him later just pop up and no-sell the injury. So, I mean, I think it's a great finish for a heel, but it just made no sense. They went through all this trouble, and he didn't even sell the injury. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's where we get into the Super Cena stuff because, you know, for a while there, Cena could be touched. You know, he, he now, at least at least he sells a lot now. That's one thing I'll say about Cena. And I, I will knock Cena's hard work. And uh, I guess it's not Cena's fault. Yeah. I guess that's – because we got to remember, WWE has agents, they have writers, they have all this. So I'm sure Cena does – Cena has input. And I'm sure Cena has a lot of input. But at the end of the day, I would think he doesn't. Yeah, you're kind of breaking up on us there a little bit, and I don't want to miss any of the important words that that are coming out of your microphone. Let's turn it off. How about that? Is it better? Mm, not where uh, we're, we're we're getting like feedback on you. Really? Uh, hmm. I don't know why. I, I'm I'm about two feet away from my Wi-Fi box. All right, there we. I think I think that sounds a little better. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. So so you know you were talking about Super Cena. And I guess that kind of brings me to my next point. And this is something I wanted to talk about, too, with you, is that, you know, there was this outcry, this backlash on the Internet about Super Cena after right. the match, you know, and especially when when he didn't sell it, when he didn't sell, sell the thing uh, on the postgame show. And, you know, you had people outraged and they're sick of Cena and, you know, they think that that Cena is just getting this monster push and, and, and they want WWE to do something different. And, you know, I don't know about you. But I'm not a big Cena fan. Um, I, I, I respect I respect what he's done, and I think he's a hard worker. But you know, I mean, it's just not not my thing. Not 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 what I like to watch. But he is guilty, right? Which is which is okay. I mean, it's he, he generally doesn't appeal to our demographic. So, and that's not what they got him there for. Because he's you know that that's not what he's selling to. He's selling towards the kids and towards the girls and. Uh, I would think uh, guys that appeal to our demographic are more of the the hard workers. Like the not saying, and I don't say that Cena don't work hard. 
more of the Brian Danielsons, the you know those guys, the Dean Ambrose, uh, who's somebody who's on the Indies. You want to pay attention. You really want to see get pushed more instead of the the commercial guy, to, so to say. Yeah, and you know, and and and, and to your point, it's like. Um, when it comes to people like you and me, we're in the minority and I don't think people realize that, you know, when people get on, on the internet and they, you know, and they, they bitch and complain about, um, you know, about, about Cena and that kind of thing. And they want CM Punk to have this monster push and Daniel Bryan to have this monster push. I love Daniel Bryan. I, I'd like to see it too. And, you know, you and I already talked about Cesaro, but, you know, at the end of the day, you and I and a lot of those fans are such a small minority that, like you said, you know, their, their business are the families, the, the wives that are, that are bugging their, their husbands to go and watch and their boyfriends to watch Cena and the kids that are bugging their parents to, to buy those goofy looking hats. And, you know, at at the end of the day, nothing's going to change. And if I were running that business, and Luke, I'm sure if you were in charge of WWE, you'd probably do the same thing. You'd probably be pushing Cena to the moon too. Of course, yeah. It's uh, it's one of the things. Well, why why wouldn't you? He's uh, you know, he he he's a top guy, of course, and he works hard. He sells tickets, and there is a noticeably major major difference in in, in seats and sales when Cena is on the show and not on the show. And yeah. I mean that. If it don't make dollars, it don't make sense, bottom line. So Cena sells tickets. Cena's got to be a top guy. And, if, you know, at the same time, Cena stepped back. He took a break for a long time. Yeah. There was many times when Cena wasn't there or, or didn't have the main spot, you know. And uh, I, I don't remember who had it at the time. It might have been Punk. But, but so at the same time, Cena has to have his due and his time. And again, how long is it going to last? You know, I, I hope not forever. Yeah. Uh, I hope they give somebody else a chance. And. I guess what Cena's doing now is is building Ryback. We'll see what they do with Ryback, but I'd also like to see some other guys in that spot. And at, at this point, I don't I don't know who else could take that spot. Who who do you think could take that spot? Well, that's that's exactly my point. You know, I wrote a blog on this, and that was exactly my point. It's like you know, you're tired of Cena. You don't want him pushed anymore. You want something new. But what else is there? There's really there's there's not anybody else. I don't think anyway. I don't think there's anybody else in there that can do the kind of business that he does. And it's funny, Luke, because you know you have you have people, and I, and and I think that when you're in the business, you get a better pre- appreciation for this stuff. When you're in the business, you look more at the dollars and cents. And you know, I mean, you're you're a promoter, you're, you're a wrestler, you know, you're you're a trainer. Um, I mean, I've booked, I've been an announcer. I mean, I even wrestled back in the day. Um, so I mean, you know, I'm always looking at the dollars and cents you know what what's putting asses in the seats and whenever like you said whenever cena hasn't been that top guy those the same amount of asses have not been in those seats so i'm looking at the roster now and i don't see anybody that can even touch him in terms of drawing power right and i mean i tell you every time i'm there i see a ton of smoking hot chicks in john cena shirts wow so there's every time I'm up there. That's no BS, man. I, I always see a ton of hot girls, and if they're not if they're not all slutted up, they're, they're wearing Cena gear. Wow. So, uh, you know, and that that, I, that speaks volumes. So, yeah. so somebody has to draw that crowd. They, they like they like Orton too, but I think uh, I think they like Cena more. Yeah, and you know, it's not like they haven't experimented. You know, it's like you look back at at, um, at CM Punk and you look at the big push they gave him. I always go back to Money in the Bank 2011, which you know the, those same fans that complained about Cena, that was their their crowning moment. That was what what they've always wanted to see was that 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 CM Punk and that angle. And at the end of the day, it didn't really do that much business. And here we are, so many years later. And I know there's a lot of people that like Punk, and I thought his match with Undertaker was great um, at Mania. And I, and again, I respect you know what he's done. But at the end of the day, he doesn't put he doesn't put behinds in the seat like Cena does and for these people to be complaining over and over again you know get Cena out of there put Punk in there I mean that's that's all well and good but you know uh, trying to explain that to the stockholders when they're looking at the ratings and they're looking at the buy rates and the merchandise sales and they're wondering what the hell happened to John Cena there, there's a few reasons for that though I think one you know one is definitely a look thing because Punk's not a jacked up muscle head mm-hmm. and, and two most of the time you know like right now Punk's a heel Right. Or punk, punk, punk. Are you there? Yeah, yep. Yeah, punk, punk comes from a different angle than than the John Cena does. They're they're two completely different characters. Yeah. So a CM Punk is not going to appeal as much to a child than a John Cena would or a Kane would, and you know most of our audience is kids. 
Yeah. So, so I, I would, I would say, what would you say that the audience, you know, ratio is? Oh God, I would definitely say um, when you look at the demographics, I would say it's majority uh, families, you know, kids, um, wives, and husbands. I mean, I think people, you know, like you are, you and I, I think, you know, teenagers or I would say, you know, kids in their twenties. I don't think there's they make up a big chunk of it. I think really it's families. Yeah, I, I would, I would totally agree that it's families, and you know, the CM Punk style doesn't appeal to an eight, nine, ten-year-old kid. Right. That's where the Rey Mysterio comes in, or the you know, or the Cena, or, or the Kane. Yep. Uh, so, so the guy, the I say the teenagers want to see Punk. The younger guys want to see Punk. You know, and they they really appreciate his work value, but uh, or or his you know, quote unquote shooting stuff like that. Um, but but when it comes to kids, they don't understand that. And at the end of the day, when this kid's begging on his you know, pulling on his dad's pocket, saying I want to go see Raw, I want to go see Raw, I want to go see John Cena, I want to go see Rey Mysterio. That's what it all relies on. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, just to kind of wrap this up, it's, uh, you know, I can I can certainly understand the frustration because, you know, I mean, Cena is not a guy that, that I personally enjoy watching. But at the end of the day, it's like you just come to grips with, you know, this guy's not going anywhere. It's either watch a different promotion, you know, get some tapes, watch Wildcat Sports, you know. Uh, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, or, you know, stop watching wrestling because um, nothing's going to change. And I feel bad for you because, um, you know, here's a question. And I wrote, you know, and I, was, I wrote about this a little bit in my blog. And if I grew up now, you know, I started watching wrestling when I was like eight years old. How old were you when you started watching wrestling? I guess that was my heyday. I, I, my earliest memories are three. Oh, wow. Um, I loved it. I even got like uh, I got some old pictures of me at about three years old holding up Hulk Hogan dolls. Um, oh, wow. But that probably about eight or nine in that age was where I really, you know, was full fledged into it. Because when you're younger, I don't have too many memories of the five, six, seven age range, you know? Yeah, I yeah. guess my, more of my kid range memories were, were from eight and beyond. And I always remember being a major fan from that point. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. So three. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so it was eight for me. And I was saying the other day that if I grew up now, if I was eight years old now and I started watching wrestling, you know, I hate to say it, but I don't even think I'd be a fan because... You know, I mean, I could never see myself, even as a kid, I mean, I, I never really got into guys like John Cena. I mean, I liked Roddy Piper, you know, when I was a kid watching wrestling. I liked, I liked Captain Lou Albano. I liked Magnificent Morocco. You know, I always liked the heels. And, um, you know, I think if I was watching wrestling now as an eight-year-old kid and just discovering it, and I saw John Cena on there, and it was Cena, 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 I, I don't even really think that, that I would stick with it. I think I'd probably watch a couple of shows and, and probably tune out. Really? Yeah. See, I, I don't remember at that age. I remember that I like guys like the Warrior and Hogan, and I wanted to see. And uh, I say my favorite wrestlers were Perfect and and Henning. I mean, uh, Henning and Rude. But I remember those didn't really come along later till I was around twelve or thirteen. Mm -hmm. Where I really started paying attention to those guys and watching the work value and saying, "Oh God, these guys are good," or or liking what they're doing. I think when I was a kid, I was more fascinated with the cartoon as aspect of it. Yeah. 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 And me too. You know, I, I, I definitely had that period when I got into that cartoon aspect. And it's funny because um, even today, I, I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, I think John Cena is a heck of a, a lot better in the ring than the Ultimate Warrior. But honestly, I'd probably watch an Ultimate Warrior match before I'd watch his match just because I, I, I grew up in that era. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think uh, I think Warrior had more drawing power. I think uh, Warrior oh, really yeah. screwed up. Um then again, you know, Warrior wasn't around as much as Cena is because so so back in the day, you might have been saying we might have been saying the same thing. If, yeah. we, if we got burnt out and burnt out on the Warrior, how many times did Warrior disappear? Yeah. Oh yeah, you, a lot. And and it always happened. It always happened. There were certain guys that you wanted to see more of. Like uh, that's one thing that used to kill me with uh, Mr. Perfect. He would always disappear. Yeah. And I had no reason. You know, I wonder where the hell the guy went. Yeah. Yeah. So, when some. When's the first time? I mean, you know, I mean, you and I grew, grew up in different eras of, of wrestling, but when's That's the first you're time? Super old. Yeah, I am super old, Luke. I am <laughs> <laughs> very true. Uh, you know, when when was it that you kind of um, I don't want to say smartened up, but like started like reading newsletters or like like how did you discover newsletters and that kind of thing? I didn't. I didn't. Okay. Uh, I I didn't get in that till God the internet years yeah. late, much much later. Mm. 
my late, maybe late teens, early twenties. Uh, I don't even know if I got into it then. Wow. I, and to this, to this day, I still don't like it. I, I don't, you know, I, I hate them. I hate these stupid websites that, that want to spoil it. And I hate, you know, I hate all these jackasses on the internet who say, oh, they don't. And I, I think I told you this. I think we talked about this on the first podcast. I'm not sure. Um, but I, I, I preach it. I hate these jackasses who sit there and they get on the internet and they bash everything and they say, oh, I'm not surprised. I don't, you know, I, they, they never do this and never do that. But these guys are the first ones going, hey, I took a picture of Chris Jericho at the airport today. He's a surprise guy. And they put oh, it all right, over. Yes. So, uh, you know, it's like, like you're going to sit here and you're going to complain about it yet. You're the same jackasses, you know, who want to be the first ones to spoil it for everybody. So I'd rather not read it because I like to be surprised. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean that, that makes good. You make a good point. Um, I don't know. I've I've, I've always been um, fascinated with the inner workings of the business and all the Gaga and, and stuff like that. I mean, I love I love reading, you know, hi, you know, history books on wrestling, like Luthez's book. Uh, there was Dude, one Luthez's book. book was one of the best books I ever read. Absolutely, and you learn so much. I mean, you really do. Um, you right. know, in some of the shoot interviews that I've got to conduct with our video when, when I talk to the old school guys, you know, I mean, you really, you're, you're, you're lucky. You're a lucky guy. Uh, yeah, a- absolutely. I mean, I, I really am. But, you know, I was going to mention, I think it was like 86 or 87. Um, you know, I used to, you know, I'm from Philly, so I used to go to the, to the Spectrum. And there was this group of guys. I remember one guy's name was Richie, who's no longer with us. And I forget who these other guys were. Um, and, um, and they had Melter's newsletter. And this was like 86, like 80, 85, 86, somewhere, somewhere around there. And yeah. um, they used to bring it to the Spectrum. And they would read it. And they would kind of like pass it around. And um, somehow I was able to get my hands on it. And I was like hooked, like immediately. I mean, this well, is like like eighty six. They, they didn't have that stuff down here. This is well, you know, the South was a whole different machine. Yeah. Oh, uh, I mean, I, like I said, it's still like that now. I mean, they have the internet, sure, but like the, the crowd is so different. There's such a night and day difference in a Philly and an LA crowd compared to a Southern Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama crowd. I mean, this is this is old school. You know, they're popping on, you know, a drop kick here on a hip toss. Yeah. Where up in Philly, you know, they're going to, you start doing that stuff, they're going to start chanting, this is boring, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, you know, I remember reading it early and just, you know, and, and just getting hooked. And it's funny because, you know, I've been reading Melters, you know, since 86 and, you know, I mean, sometimes I, I like what Melzer says, and then sometimes I, I'm not a fan. But I've always respected him because, I mean, I don't know. It's just I've I've been reading him for for so many years that you just kind of, um, you know, you just you just kind of follow along. But so many other guys have tried to pop up over the years, and some of them I've been friends with, some of them I've been I've I've been enemies with, and I just think that nobody has even, you know, I would say Wade Keller's probably come the closest. Um, and Wade's been around for a long time. I remember reading Wade's um sheet you know a while back too but like nobody's really like touched like uh melter and, and i know p- some people will be offended by that but it's just um i don't know it, i don't even know how we got on this topic but i just was curious about like you know in the south like how you got onto that kind of stuff yeah i i really i really didn't and uh i still to this day don't I, i'll read stuff but i don't believe everything i read on the internet first off yeah and uh and, and being in the locker room i find out a lot of it's bs half the time or you know it is what people make of it um but it's just one of the things I I really I didn't care to know what's going. On. I I mean, do I want do I want to know what's going on? Yeah, but I I don't want spoilers. I would say, but I I like to know who's got heat and who's got this. But, but right. when you think about it, it's you know half of it's not true. They say, oh, you know, Antonio Cesaro's in the doghouse or this guy. You know, it's like come on, like this yeah. guy's working hard. This guy's out here busting his ass. He's one of the best things I got on the card. And what would a guy like that be in a doghouse for? Right. Exactly. exactly. I mean, I know him personally. He's a gentleman of gentlemen's. Oh, it's so. a, he's, a, he's a gentleman. He's hilarious. He, he's he, he's the best. I, I love that guy. Yeah. So you go when you read something like that, you're like you're thinking, you know, how the hell would a guy like this be in a doghouse? Because because yeah. he's in a doghouse because they dropped the title. They took the title off him. Yeah. Come, you know, come on. And you know what's funny too is, and and I'd love to get your thoughts on this. And you know, I mean, I've always kind of looked at it um, from the perspective as as you know, as being as having a job in the business. And you know, I always think that it's 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 weird when people get so outraged that this guy is um, getting buried and this guy's not being used right. 
And yet, you know, at the end of the day, the guy's got a contract. The guy's making six figures a year. The guy's living his dream. And maybe his dream isn't putting over, you know, Randy Orton in three minutes. But at the end of the day, you know, he's not working in a sunglass hut. He's not, you know, working at the gym. He's not, you know, digging ditches. He, right. He's working in the WWE. And Which honestly, I've done about just everything you named. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and it's, it's, and, and I know, you know, and I know you, and I know, you know, hundreds of, of, of talented wrestlers that would, you know, uh, that would do anything to get that opportunity. I mean, I'm, I don't know, Luke, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm sure you wouldn't mind making six figures a year to put over Randy Orton in three minutes. No, I'd be wearing a dress if they told me to. <laughs> so it's just, it's, it, and so would so many other guys. Not saying that's what you'd be happy doing. Right. But at the same time, you're happy making a name and being there and getting paid and getting a paycheck to do what you love. And it, it's like one of those things where I hear all these guys bitching about going to FCW or, or you know, being down in developmental. What are you bitching about? You're getting paid to train, to do something you're supposed to be doing anyway. Yep. You're getting paid to do it. Otherwise, you'd be at home working a nine to five job, you know, and probably busting your ball somewhere and trying to fit in training. Yep. So when you're there, you're getting paid and that's all you have to do. And then the rest of the time is your free time or or your time. You you take a guy like Xavier Woods, who I don't, you know, a lot of people don't notice. This guy is such a hard worker behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Xavier Woods is, it's not only is he using his time there, he's wrestling. He's now getting his PhD. Wow. You know, so this guy's going to be a doctor and he's, he's doing it all while he's under WWE contract, while he's there training. And he's using his free time to go to school and get his PhD. Good I mean, how many him. guys do that? Yeah. Good. Well, I, wasn't Shane Douglas supposed to go back to school and get his PhD? <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> I, I wonder how that worked for him. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's funny because generally, um, you know, I remember reading in Bret Hart's book. And the one thing that he said that, that really stuck out is he said when he first got to the WWF, that he was frustrated because he was working hard and he was having these good matches with Dynamite Kid, but he really wasn't getting anywhere. He wasn't getting a big push. He was kind of slotted as that like opening, like opening mid card guy, and really didn't see anything on the horizon. And I think he said it was Pat Patterson that took him aside. It was either Pat Patterson or Chief J Strongbow that told him to hang in there because the cream always rises to the top. And I think that that's true even today because you look at a guy like Daniel Bryan. And you go back to, you know, he won money in the bank and everybody thought that he was off to the races and he was going to get this monster push. And for like the next six months, the guy got jobbed out every friggin' night, every friggin' night the guy was doing a job for somebody. And then eventually he got his push. And now here we are, I think it's what, like uh, a year and a half later. And the guy's one of the most over guys in the company. The guy has a a phenomenal spot, um, you know, in the company. And the guy is probably making a hell of a wage. You know, he was just on WrestleMania. I'm sure he's getting a nice payoff of that. He's he he slotted in decent matches to get decent payoffs. And my point being, you know, when it comes to Antonio Cesaro, um, you know, you know, I know, and just about everybody out there knows that a guy like him is talented. Look at Dolph Ziggler. Everybody was bitching about Dolph Ziggler, me included. But eventually, you know, the cream rises to the top. So my point being here is that eventually, it might not be now, it might not be next month, it might not even be next year, but at some point, Cesaro is going to get his shot. And when he gets it, he's going to be ready. And I think at that point in time, he'll be able to solidify that spot somewhere on the roster. Right. I mean, and he's cashing checks and I'm right. I'm, I can, I can promise you he's much more happier doing what he's doing now than what he used to do. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he's, 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 he is a household name now. Yep. Absolutely. And that's the other thing, Luke, you know, I mean, how great would it be for you? You know, you go up there, let's say you sign with the WWE, you know, things don't work out, but you're on their TV for two years. You know, after that, after that, your career changes. You can ask for more money on the indies. You can you, you get more more money at autograph signings. You know, you're a WWE superstar. You can take it to Hollywood, maybe parlay it into something. I mean, you're like you know, you're just given such such an opportunity that whether you're looking at the lights or you know you're wrestling in the main event. I mean, man, you know that is just the ultimate dream right there. And that's one thing I talk to Punk about. You know, uh. I talked to Punk about a lot, actually, when Punk first really started getting his push and won his first world title, mm-hmm. the, the WWE title. Yeah. I said, dude, and then after he did the uh, thing in Chicago, I was like, you're set for life now. Yep. You know? You're set for life. Mm-hmm. So th- no matter what you do from this point on, unless you murder somebody, and even OG Simpson got away with that, yeah. but, <laughs> but you, you are set for life. You can make a living 
a good living just doing comic book conventions and this and that. You know, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do ever again. Yep. So guys don't really appreciate the value of going up there. But but at the same time, they get accustomed to the way they're living up there. And I see it all the time. Guys go up there. They think they're going to make that money forever. And then they get released. And they can't cope with not making that money or trying to find a full-time job or, you know, and that, that's, I mean, that's part of the reason so many guys kill themselves. Yeah, so, I, I, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, my plan was when I was announcing full-time and things were going really well and it kind of looked like that I might have an opportunity up there, you know, my plan from, from, from day one was like three to four years, save my money, live at home the, the whole time, and then just get the hell out of there, you know, and not put up with the bullshit or put up with the bullshit for three, four years um, and then just – Get out of there and, you know, do something with it, you know, get into radio, you know, um, do, you know, get into major, major league sports, you know, something. I mean, I always kind of looked at it as, you know, living my dream, but kind of using it as a stepping stone. And I never, I never got there, but you know, it's just, it, it amazes me sometimes when you have guys that'll hang around and hang around and they break their bodies and, and, you know, and, and they sacrifice so much when, you know, if they would have gotten out of there a couple of years earlier, you know, they, 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 they'd they be healthier and they'd be set and they'd have so much opportunity. I mean, look at Taz. Yeah. Taz is a prime example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's a shame because I, I honestly, I think you should have had a spot there. Um, you're, you're a talented guy. I don't say that because you're a friend. I genuinely like your work. Well, thank you. I appreciate I, that. I, I do believe that, you know, there's a lot you could still do. And a lot. Of, and the thing about you is there's really no age limit on, on, on commentators. There's not, but you know what? It's like, you feel kind of silly, you know. It was it was great when when it, it was such a different business. I mean, you know how it is. It was such a different business back in two thousand when I started doing it, and and really was doing it from like two thousand to two thousand and eight. You know, the indies were were much hotter. I was younger. I didn't have a family. You could make a lot of money back then on the indies because things were were just so hot. And it's like it's so different now, where it's like. You feel kind of silly to be a forty-year-old guy, you know, going to call an independent show for you know fifty bucks on a Saturday night, you know, and and that's right. no disrespect to anybody that does. I think it's I think it's awesome. I think it's it's one of I think it was a dream, you know, to even be able to do that, even make make twenty-five cents. But you know, it's like you kind of get to a point in your life where it's like, okay, you know, it's it's not, for whatever reason, it's not happening. And I kind of thought it was going to happen when I started working with uh, Steve Carino in Ring of Honor. We did, um, we did that first show, and everybody was telling us we're going to be the next Sunday Night Heat team. Everybody's saying, you know, you guys are there. You guys are going to get it. And then, you know, unfortunately, CZW and Ring of Honor had their falling out. And uh, I, I, you know, like an idiot, I chose CZW when I should have just stayed with Ring of Honor. <laughs> <laughs> It happens, man. We, uh, you know, it happens. Yeah. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say give up, you know, and I don't think you will. I just, uh, it, something will come around and they say things happen for a reason. And I, I, I don't know how true it is, but I like, you know, it, it's our beliefs and it's what we have, yeah. it's all we can go by. So I, I don't understand. It, it's the same example. I say when I don't have a deal with WWE, okay, I'm in good standing with them. I work with them a lot. I do a lot with them. Um, but I don't have a deal. Yeah. I see yeah. a lot of guys that get deals that I'm happy for, and then I go, man, how is this guy getting a deal over me? Yeah, yeah, me too. But, I mean, I mean, at the same too. time, it's that I'm not saying it might be a deal that you know that I don't want. Yeah, that I can't do it because I'm not a guy that can move to Florida for 600 bucks a week. Yeah, you know, I, I got a family, I got kids, I got a business. I make a lot more than that doing my movies and running my business, running my wrestling. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and that's the thing, you know, it's like, I look at you as, you know, it's amazing. I was, I was, um, I was thinking about it today as I was putting the notes together. Oh, you know what? I was listening to, um, an interview with Bob Holly and he was talking about the developmental and, um, I don't know. I just started, started thinking about you cause I was making some notes for the show and I'm thinking, you know, here's a guy that's good enough to put on all their television shows. That's good enough to use to, to help get guys, you know, get guys over. Not that you're getting Santino over, but you are, you know what I mean? You're, you're right. enhancing. I mean, that's what enhancement talent is. You know, you're good enough for that. You're good enough to be trusted to be put on their TV, but you're not good enough to work in their developmental league. I mean, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Well, I, I was told by developmental 
that um, last time I went down in Tampa, I think I told you, I don't know if I discussed this or not, I really didn't bring it out, but, you know, uh, I aced it. I aced it. I went down there. Yeah, you and I it. talked about it, but, I, I mean, we didn't talk about it here. We talked about it off air. Right, I, and I, I was told that I'm more valuable to them as a coach in supplying them with talent. Mm. Mm. And maybe you make a career out of that. I mean, there are a lot of guys that, that, that made a great career out of, out of training guys and coaching guys and eventually catching on and be, being a trainer down there. Who knows? Right. And I mean, do I want to be on TV? Yeah. And do I want to do it? But would I take a job as a coach? Yeah, I sure would. Yeah. So at this point, I, they feel that it's hard for them to teach me anything because of my knowledge and experience, which is, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a, pat on the back but it's also a kick in the ass sure exactly exactly so it's one of those things where you know like well you're like hey i'm glad you have a lot of respect for me and i'm glad you you know that you think that way about me but at the same time it's not all i'm going for exactly but but, you know it's like i said it's it's better than nothing so i mean at least at least i got at least i got the credentials to help others yeah exactly and at least you're on the radar right yeah um, you know, I, I want to bring it back a little bit here um, and uh, kind of go old school and, um, you know, talk about Randy Savage, the macho man. It's uh, it was a two year anniversary since he passed away. And, you know, I, I don't know what he meant to you, but to me, I mean, he meant a lot. And, you know, it's like I, I, I grew up on the guy and, you know, years later when I got into tape trading, I started getting his tapes from Memphis and I was just blown away. I mean. I, you know, I might put that out there as maybe the best that I've ever seen is his run in Memphis and his promos in Memphis were just like, just, just ridiculous. And, um, you know, I think what made him so special and what, what made him stand out. And I remember when he passed away, I, I, I actually did an interview, um, on CNN radio. And what I said was what made him so special is, you know, he came into the WWF at the time when it was like the land of the monsters, you know, it was Hogan and Andre and Bundy and stud and it was Tony Atlas and all these big guys. And you had Randy Savage, who was a pretty big dude in his own right, but kind of small in that land of the giants. And he brought this like sense of athleticism that just really, you know, wasn't there. I mean, you had the guys like the Tito Santana's and the Steamboats and the Valentines and, and Morocco's, but you didn't have anybody like Randy Savage. And, he was awesome. Yeah, he was awesome. And I remember as a kid, I mean, you know, I was like 11, 12 years old. And I mean, I, I, I certainly wasn't smart to the business, but I just knew that there was something different when I would watch a WWF show and I'd see him on there. And, you know, guys like Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart and Kurt Henning, they're usually credited as pioneering that like, you know, breakthrough, breaking through the mold and breaking through that like land of the monsters. But I really think if it wasn't for Randy Savage, that those guys would have had an even more difficult time getting to that next level. Oh, I'd agree. I mean, Savage was the guy putting Hogan over most of the time, you know, and making Hogan look good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what are your memories of, of Savage, like favorite matches or anything? Uh, man, I just, I, I, I guess as a kid, I wasn't a big Savage fan. It didn't happen until I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I think Savage, his work rate was definitely awesome. He was good. But I, I got some funny stuff about Savage. It's uh, that's why I was chuckling why you why you were saying that. Sure. My, I guess my favorite Savage memory is is you know Canyon. Chris Canyon was one of my best friends. Okay. So uh, Canyon used to say how how crazy Savage is, and like legit crazy in real life. And everybody knows the stories. You know he would he would handcuff. Miss Elizabeth in the bathroom. Yes. For a match and stuff like that. So, uh, Kenny <laughs> told me when, when, uh, he, he was supposed to have this little run with Savage. And this is when Savage was in WCW and he's doing the Slim Jim thing and all this other stuff. So, Canyon had to do this, uh, a little, a little program with him. And Canyon went, I think, on Jay Leno. I'm pretty sure it was Leno. It was one of the late night talk shows. And I'm pretty sure it was Leno because that's when Leno was doing a lot of work with those guys and stuff like that. So Canyon went on there and called him a has been and said he's washed up and, you know, he's going to kick his ass and all this stuff. Sure. And uh, (laughs) Slim Drim called Savage up and said, well, they dropped him from his contract and said, yeah, we hear this guy's on TV calling you has been and you're washed up and we don't want no guy like that representing the company. So Wow. So it costed Savage, you know, King just cutting a promo on him and it costed Savage a Slim Jim deal. Holy my, whoa, I never heard that story before. Yeah, so so Savage called Canyon up and was like, 
I'm going to effing kill you when I see <laughs> you. And, like, he was serious. So yeah. they had this whole thing for a while where, like, Candy tried to avoid him because cause Savage was threatening his life because he lost a Slim Jim deal. Oh, my God. been on the Jay Leno show. That's awesome. And Savage is a dangerous dude. I mean, there are stories about him. Um, I mean, there's a legendary story that um, when when he, uh, you know, he and his father, well, his father um, had a promotion, ICW, and it was like an outlaw territory. And, you know, back then you were either affiliated with AWA or NWA or WWF or WWWF or you were an outlaw territory. And they were an outlaw territory. And they used to go on TV and they were in competition with Jerry Lawler's group. And they would get on TV, and Savage would challenge those guys to fights, like real fights all the time. And there were matches where Savage um, would go and sit ringside and like at like the Memphis shows like as a shoot. And he wanted to fight these guys. And one time he went after uh, Bill Dundee in the parking lot. I mean, the guy was like insane. He went after Bill Dundee in the parking lot, and um, Bill Dundee had a gun. And um, he wound up getting pistol whipped or something like like from it. And there, there's a story I've heard Larry Maddisick, Larry Maddisick tell it. He's um, he used to be associated with St. Louis Wrestling. That when um, Vince finally you know saw Savage, that he liked him and wanted to sign him, but he was scared because he heard all these stories about Savage just being nuts. And um, you know, and, and there were several guys that had to actually vouch for Savage. He was a good dude when he finally went to Memphis and he did business with Lawler. You know, things kind of turned around. But he was a he was a crazy crazy son of a gun like back yeah, in the day. That's what makes me love him more. Yeah, uh, you know, you, you got to respect the passionate. Crazy guy like that. That sounds like something. I, I mean, honestly, that sounds like something I would do. Yeah, so. yeah. It's it, it, it's great stuff. Um. So yeah. So just you know, it's um, it's kind of you know, it's just it's weird. You know, the bit like not having Savage around because you have all these icons left in wrestling, and Savage was such a huge icon from from my childhood and a lot of people's childhoods. And it's just you know, there's a really big void not having him around anymore. No, it's not. And, I mean, it's a shame with the whole WWE thing. I, I'm sure you've heard the rumors of why sure. he hasn't been inducted in the Hall of Fame or yes. whatever. But uh, I, And I don't know if the Internet knows about him. Mean, so I'm sure some do, but I won't be the one to talk about it. But, uh, you know, it's like that he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame probably more than anybody. Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. More than anybody that's been inducted in like the last several years. That's well, maybe maybe not Bruno Sammartino, but other than him, right, right. Um, yeah, a, a couple other things. Um, I wanted to get to. You know, something I want to get to, but I think I'm going to save this for our next show. And I think this would be a lot of fun to talk about. You know, the last couple of weeks that we've been doing this, I've wanted to get into the CCW XPW feud and kind of just like share stories from like what was going on on your side and what was going on on our side and just like how ridiculous some of this stuff really was. But yeah, I, yeah. you know, I don't, you know, I don't know if we can do a full show on it, but I'm pretty sure we can do a lot on it. So rather than like just throw it in as a topic today and as part of the hodgepodge here of, of topics we're talking about, I think we're going to save that. Maybe the next time we do a show, we'll open up with that and we'll just kind of like uh, riff on that for a little while. I say we do it and we see where we go with. It. I think we can talk forever on that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that would be a lot of fun too. Definitely. Yeah. Um. So you know, Dixie Carter, TNA president Dixie Carter, you know. She's she she says a lot of dumb things, Luke. I mean, you just I, I don't read this woman's Twitter, but I see like what people are reporting. I mean, the woman just says just uh, some really uh, insane things. Um, she but, is a woman. Uh, she, just, just... she is a woman. Yes, she is a woman. One thing she said um, last week that made a lot of headlines, and I think it kind of got blown out of proportion a little bit. And I'm certainly not a defender, but I'm also you know I'm not looking to to bash somebody if it's not warranted. Is she did an interview. And she said that she was open to having joint shows with WWE and TNA together. And, you know, she would because that would boost up TNA. Exactly. And people started ba- people started trashing her. And I mean, the whole thing took on a life of its own. Like people were making these false reports. Like Dixie said that she wanted her, um, you know, her to send her developmental guys to WWE. And she never said that. All she said is that she'd be open to joint shows. And honestly, I didn't think it was a dumb thing to say at all because if I'm her, I mean, if 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 you're you you own a promotion, you know, why wouldn't you want to have a joint show with WWE? Right. Look what the stuff it did for ECW. Look what it did. Uh, uh, you know, with the um, uh, what's what's um, God, what was the name of the Memphis stuff? Uh, it guys down. Well, they had Smoky Mountain well, no. and USWA and the stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. So, I mean, they would always send Smoky Mountain guys when that was the developmental. Look at what it did for those territories. Why would you know? And I think this. I mean, I actually think those territories were bigger than TNA. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, there is an argument, and I remember this because I was, you know, I was, I was pretty immersed in the business back then, you know, with the territories. There was an argument, and, you know, uh, taking a devil's advocate point of view, in that having those, those WWF stars, WWF at the time, and WWF joint shows actually killed those territories. Because, and I'll throw this at you, and maybe, you know, you can give me some thoughts on this as a promoter, is that once, you know, if you're a Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and once you bring in The Undertaker, um, to Knoxville. Let's say you're going to Knoxville. That's your home base, and you, and you bring in the Undertaker. It's like you draw all these people, and you're putting the Undertaker over as this huge megastar. But you know, next week you got you got to come back with the Dirty White Boy and Tracy Smothers and the Rock and Roll Express. And it's like now you're showing your fans that it's like our guys are are, are good and our guys you know are local, but these are the stars. We roll out the red carpet for the WWF guys. And some people will say that it actually killed the territories because once they brought in the WWF guys, people just waited and wanted to come back and see the WWF guys, and their guys were kind of marginalized. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Uh, I mean, I, I guess looking at it from that point, it's it's could be true, but uh, I I wasn't in that era. I didn't have that, you know. Like yeah. I, I didn't get to grow up on that, so I, I can't really speak on that experience. Sure, I didn't get to go to all these local shows. I wasn't around for the mid south stuff. I mean, I, I was, but I I didn't you know I didn't really know about it because I didn't. Dude, I was a poor white kid. I didn't have you know I lived in the hood. Yeah, I was like a white kid in the, in, the, in the neighborhood, so I didn't you know I didn't have cable. I didn't have any of that stuff, so I, I didn't really get a chance. To see wrestling, which was only wrestling I got to see was which was WWF when it was on, and I was by a friend's house or by a, a family member's house or something that that I could check it out at. Yeah, you know? so that 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 was my growing up things of wrestling. And my first shows were were some local shows around here called I think it was NWF, mm-hmm. and it was like I think I, I think I, I think we talked about this already. On, on yeah, we did. We talked about our indie uh, our indie experiences there, going to indie. Yeah, shows. so so that's when where I got to get my first experiences on you know some some hands on wrestling with with guys I did not know. Yeah, yeah. So as, as well as some I did like the Junkyard Dog and you know Bob Armstrong and but then 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 you see the guys like I said the Night Stalker who was Adam Bomb and uh, you know and they had Paul Warndorf there and. They had, you know, that's when I first seen uh, Jim Powers and um, this the guy Wild, Wild Thing. I, I don't remember what his name was, but you know, I remember he was like one of the big stars of the show. Yeah. So that that, that was my. I I don't know if that hurts. It doesn't hurt us with Wildcat. Yeah. I don't think I like to use it. I mean, I just had Chris Masters wrestle with Buku Dao, and they tore it up, and all they did was make Buku Dao a bigger star. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, I I think people were bashing her and not really, you know, looking at the big picture. I mean, you know, I mean, who knows? You know, if you put WWE and TNA shows, you know, I mean, people aren't stupid. You know, it's like they know WWE are already bigger stars. I mean, you put, um, you know, Randy Orton on on a show with uh, James Storm. And, you know, obviously Randy Orton's going to get that monster reaction. Um, But, you know, I just thought it was it was interesting that she, she came out and said it. Um, but I thought she got a little too much heat for saying it. I'll give you a prime example, and I and I'm using me. Um, and it, it's it's kind of weird to talk about this, or tr- I guess it's kind of putting me over. But but at the same time, it's it's the truth. I wrestled Matt Hardy for the first time two weeks ago. Yeah, I want to talk about that. So let's talk about that. Okay, so this is the deal. It was on a show that was about five hours away from my home. In the sticks, that that's not a regular promotion. This was the first time they ran a show, and it was Cassie Raleigh who ran the show. He was a former WWE developmental guy. Yeah, I kind of remember. I remember the name. Right. He was a TNA guy for a while. He, he did the whole rape gimmick with Raven. Uh, he kind of looks similar to Shane Douglas. <laughs> uh, I like I like Cassidy. So uh, Cassidy lives about five hours away. Now, he ran a show about five hours away in, in between Monroe and Shreveport, and um, down this road that was about forty five minutes off the interstate, down a, you know like a like a long country road. Yeah. To get in, so I'm thinking, here I am wrestling Matt Hardy for the first time with all this hype, and it's gonna be at this backwoods ass show. Yeah. You know that probably nobody's gonna see. Maybe a hundred people are gonna see. Yeah. And the house was packed. Once we got there, doors open, about a thousand people there. That's awesome. It was crazy. 
They had Al Snow. They had Robbie E. They had that Jesse guy from uh, from uh, Big Brother. That's with TNA. Yeah. They had uh, Matt Hardy and myself. They had who else was there? Uh, some of the Wildcat guys, but they had another name guy. There. I'm trying to think of who it was. Um, Chase Stevens from TNA. Okay. Uh, but they, you know, they had a lot of guys with a lot of experience and, and star power. And from TNA and WWE, sure. and here I am. I've never been on the contract with neither one. I've never wrestled in this area except I've wrestled in Monroe and I've wrestled in Shreveport for WWE in dark matches. Okay. So this is not close to me at all. I'm thinking nobody's gonna know who I am up here. Doors open. I sold about fifteen hundred dollars in merchandise. Get out of here! That's so, awesome. God bless you. I think that's great, dude. They had Luke Hawks fans out the wazoo. They follow everything that was going on with me and Matt Hardy. They announced, uh, you know, people were bringing pictures that they printed up of me, and it was crazy. And um, when they announced, um, they, like, they, you know, they said, we have this star here, they have this star here. They said, we have Robbie E from TNA and Jesse and Al Snow. And the crowd's like, pop, 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 but not, you know, like just yeah. a, a clap, a few claps. Yeah. They say we have, you know, Luke Hawks, crowd goes crazy. They say we have Matt Hardy, crowd goes crazy. And I'm going, holy shit, does this feel good? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? These guys are on TV. And not to take anything away from those guys, because I think Robbie and them are hard workers. And, uh, you know, they're on TV. But it felt good to be more over, I would say, than, and more, you know, more hyped than, uh, than, than some guys that are on TV every week. Sure, sure. sure. So I mean, like, like I'll I'll take my doing that, and I'll say that me and Matt Hardy sold that mo- mofo out. You know that we we take credit for that because that's who they came to see. They wanted to see Luke Hawks and Matt Hardy. I think that's awesome. I think so. So how was the match? We beat the hell out of each other. Yeah, Be- beat the hell out of each other, and ended up being a double count out. So uh, where the locker room separated, you know, the locker room had to separate us. So uh, it, it was it was it was a brutal match. Uh, and, and like I said, the crowd was really really into it. So I couldn't I couldn't have asked for better. Only thing I would have really liked to do was was be in Philly because I think that crowd deserved to see it. Yeah, you know that that's exactly what I'm thinking. I'm thinking about you know as you're talking about your match and you're talking about the crowd. I'm thinking, man, you know, if you actually got got into a city, you know that that some some place like Philly that had, had had some time invested in that angle, man, you guys could have done something special. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think we still could. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to, I guess we'll have to, uh, you know, hopefully somebody will take control and put this on Philly because I, I want another shot at it. I want to take another crack at it. Yeah, yeah, I, I hope so. I really do too. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, it's great because you guys, it seemed like at Extreme Rising, they were really starting to do something different with you and Matt Hardy. And, you know, I, I told you privately that I was really enjoying, you know, the interaction and stuff. Um, and it just kind of sucked that, that things fell apart the way they did with the company at the end. Right, right. It did. And, uh, you know, we, we've had offers, but here's the thing, you know, we, we've got we've got a legit feud going on and, you know, we, we want at each other. We want to tear at each other. But at the same time, it has to be to around each other's schedules. Yeah. You know, it has to be. I mean, I'm busy. He's busy. And I understand that. So so we have to it has to be booked somewhere. We can't snap our fingers and make it happen in the alley. Yeah. You know, that's just that's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think that's great. Um, hopefully, do you, do you do you have anything booked uh, with him uh, coming up, or or no, nothing on the books. Not not nothing on the books yet. So hopefully, uh, hopefully, I I know uh, somebody was interested in taking it over to England. Uh, another company in Maryland tried to try to get it, but Matt was already booked on the date. So yeah, a lot of people want it. I think uh, I think the company up in Minnesota wants to do it. So so. You know, I'll beat this guy up seven days a week if I can. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you, you know, uh, he deserves it, quite frankly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> For being a douchebag. <laughs> um, but no, you know, I mean, it's funny because we're talking about this. And, um, you know, I mean, I think you guys have the potential if schedules work out and um, and, and business is, is right. I think it has the potential to be one of those feuds that you could just see kind of traveling around the country on the different independents. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I definitely, I definitely see that. I definitely think we can uh, both make some good shows, you know, yeah. make some, some, some good, some good independent shows, and and put some asses in some seats. 
Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, as we start to wrap up here, I uh, I put a blog up over at um, Camel Clutch Blog today, and it was the top 10 WWE Championship Shockers. And what the, the essence of the blog was is just top 10, you know, title changes, just WWE title changes, where you were just like, what the F? You know, it was just like, like you didn't expect it. Um, you know, the, the top one that I put on there, because it was, you know, I lived it as a kid, was Iron Sheik beating Bob Backlund. I mean... You know, what you have to understand is at that time, Backlund had the title. Um, I want to say he won it in 78 um, and, and lost. So it was like, I think it was uh, six years. I think it was 84 uh, when, or December 83. So a little shy of, of six years. And, you know, and Backlund had some decent challengers along the way. But Iron Sheik really, you know, he was pushed as, as a guy, but he wasn't pushed as this, like, monster. I mean, there were guys that were pushed a lot harder than him that Backlund survived against. And, um, you know, and, and I remember Iron Sheik the month before, he was wrestling Tony Gurria at Madison Square Garden. So, you know, he was a guy that I remember, you know, I used to call the WWF hotline. It wasn't, it wasn't a 900 number, what they used to have. They used to have this just this regular number. It was just a regular number. It was like a voicemail. And, yeah. and after the Madison Square Garden shows, they would just put the like Howard Finkel, our buddy Howard Finkel, he would just put the results on there, you know. So I would wait, you know, and call at like midnight or whatever. And I heard it, you know, Iron Sheik beats Bob Backlund for the world title. I'm just like, what? Um, so, you know, I want to ask you, you know, what, you know, coming off the off the top of your head, what were moments, you know, as a kid, you know, when you watched the title change as a kid where you were just like, oh, my God. Probably when uh, when Hogan came back. Mm. with uh yoko and brett mm -hmm. because th yeah. that was you know it was unexpected yep uh let's see to just that's not, a not that one. it's a shocker it was just so unexpected you yeah, know that's a good one um that that's the first one that jumps out in my head oh let me see what else Man, you, you got me in a blank on this yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I believe me, I did my research. I, I didn't come up with, with the stuff off the top of my head either. I just, you know, I mean, I just, you know, I know there's always one. You know, I mean, for me, it was always Sheik beating Backlund. You know, there's always one that, like, sticks out. I, I, I was there for the Money in the Bank with the uh, with the Jeff Hardy punk for the first time. That that was a cool one. Okay, okay, yeah. So so, so that's, a, that's a good one as, as well. Yeah, no, I just... You know, I put the list together today, and I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll throw it, throw it out at you, and you know, see see if you had anything. Yeah, I have to do some research. What do you think? Uh, like I said, she can she can backlin for me. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, in terms of wrestling history, um, it, it would probably be Ivan Koloff beating Bruno Sammartino, but I didn't live during that era. I'm only you know taking what I've read, what I've talked to Bruno, I've talked to Ivan, you know, what I've heard. But you know, I mean, what's really cool about that story is. You know, um, both of them told me that when when Ivan pinned Bruno, that the place which was sold out and you remember, well, I mean, you've seen tape like how crazy those fans were back then. I mean, they believed everything was real and it is, of course, but they, you know, they, they were they were buying everything that when Ivan pinned Bruno, that the place was silent, that it was silent, like, like nobody said a word because they were in such shock. And Bruno told me that he thought that he lost his hearing. He thought that he injured his ear because, you know, he had the crowd go in the whole match. And then all of a sudden, it's just dead silence. And it was the fact that people were just in such shock. And, I mean, I, I don't think it really gets get, gets much better than that. Right, right. Yeah, that's it. I, I'd like to go back, honestly, and I'm going to look at your list now. Mm -hmm. And uh, just I, I haven't had a chance to. I've been so busy, and then I go out of town tomorrow. Sure. So I, I'm definitely going to get on and look at your list. And I, I'd like to go back and actually catch up and watch maybe some of the things I didn't see ever. You know, uh, so I'm sure there's something on there that I didn't get a chance to watch as a kid. So I want to go back and look at what you wrote down and do a little research myself and check it out. Maybe we can talk about this on the next week's episode. Awesome. Awesome. I also, I'd also like to discuss put it, put your notes. Uh, I got a really funny story about 900 numbers for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> can we talk? Is it clean? Oh, it's clean, but it's, it's hilarious. Okay. <laughs> so. All right. All right. De definitely. Definitely. No, no I never, 
I never had the 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 guts to uh, call the 900 numbers. Um, you know, I was like, parents would kill me. But now nah, they used to have WWF used to have this number. It was weird. It was like just this voicemail, and um, they would just put up Madison Square Garden results after every show because it was like their pay per view back then. So well, was, we we get we get it's a it's a quick story. Okay. Right, I'll just say you know it. what? Let's let no. Let's wait. Let, we gotta we gotta leave a cliffhanger every once in a while. <laughs> All right. Let's give him a cliffhanger. You know what? We're at an hour. I think we covered a lot of topics today. I've, I've had a blast, you know, so why don't we take, you know, these final minutes here and uh, I'll throw it to you to, to plug away. Anything you want to talk, talk to the listeners about? Yeah, I got a big show in Orlando, Florida uh, this Friday night, two days from now, as I wrestle John Morrison for the first time. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, for an indie company out there called Continental Wrestling Federation. And then uh, Saturday night, I'm wrestling Bruce Santee for uh, the first time ever, who me and Bruce have been trying to go at it for about eight years now. So we got that. And June 8th, Wildcat returns. Check us out at wildcatsports.com. And, of course, follow us on Twitter, Wildcat Sports, and Luke Hawks 504 on Twitter. All right, good stuff. I, I, I'm I'm curious. Next time um, we're on the air here, I want to talk to you about the John Morrison match. I'm curious. I think you guys could – I mean, you know, there's so much potential there to just blow the roof off. Yeah, uh, we've been looking forward. That's another match I've really been looking for. I've known John a long time since he started, so uh, so so it's really nice to get to go at it and finally go at it. Yeah. You know, yeah, he, definitely. He, he's a talented guy. He's a really talented guy. So it's nice to be able to share a ring with him. He's a talented guy, but he deserves an ass kicking. He does. Well, I, I didn't say I wasn't going to kick his ass. <laughs> uh, well, you know, on my end here, uh, you can always, um, you know, if you missed any of the show or you want to go back and listen to some older shows, I, I, I post the show everywhere. I have a YouTube, YouTube channel. You can look up Camel Clutch Blog on YouTube, um, on iTunes. You can just uh, search Pro Wrestling Radio. Of course, ProWrestlingRadio.com. You listen to this show and old shows and all kinds of old interviews. The, the Bruno interview I was there talking about, about is on there. Um, and also Camel Clutch Blog. Dot com. That's uh, my wrestling and, and MMA and, and whatever blog. And you go there and, um, you know, read the top 10 championship shockers and uh, anything else that's coming down the pike that's over at camelclutchblog.com. And you can tweet me as well at camelclutchblog. And Luke, I'm looking at the calendar and, um, you know, uh, I'm not going to send anything in stone yet, but it's looking like our next show will probably be uh, June 4th or June 5th. And uh, I'll talk to you and we'll put a time together. But um, so we already got. So the next show, we already got some some topics. We already got the CCW XPW feud, which we're going to talk a lot about. Uh, right. We got your match with uh, John Morrison and nine hundred numbers. Nine hundred numbers, baby! I can't wait for that one. Yeah. So all, hey, don't don't forget to watch Wildcat Sports on YouTube. Yeah. How, how can they find it? Do you do you have your own YouTube channel or? Yeah, check out just Google Wildcat YouTube Wildcat Sports. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, uh, there's there's many things come up, you know, some people record with their cell phones and stuff, uh, but definitely check out, you know, the, the official Wildcat Sports. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, Luke, I want to thank you, uh, as always, for uh, being on the show today. It's always black. I mean, it goes super fast. I mean, I feel like we just started the show two minutes ago. Yeah, I know. Right. It's crazy. We could we could probably do this for hours. But at the same time, I, it might it might burn people out. So, yeah, I think it's a uh, good timing. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, good luck. Uh, you know, good luck uh, with your uh, match with uh, John Morrison. I'm, I'm sure you guys will blow the roof off and uh, we'll talk about it uh, when we're back here uh, June 4th or June 5th. For sure, for sure. Thanks for having us. Thank, guys, thanks for listening to us. Yep, thanks for listening. Spread the word and um, and rate us on iTunes because that's how we can uh, develop a little following here. So we appreciate okay. it. And, uh, and that's it. All Peace right. That was awesome. That was great, Luke. Yeah, yeah. It was this is Eric Arjulo, your host of Pro Wrestling Radio. And don't forget to check out my daily blog, www.camelclutchblog.com where you can read about wrestling, mixed martial arts, football, all sports, pop culture, politics, and more. That's www.camelclutchblog.com.